All right. So while we're waiting for everyone else to join, I can go ahead and just get us started with some introductions. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me or who I haven't worked with, uh, my name is Emily Harris. I'm the program coordinator for the Choose Clean Water Coalition. We are based in Annapolis. And I know we have a lot of folks, um, both from members of the coalition and also beyond who are joining us today um, from far and wide. So I'm really grateful that you all took the time to join this conversation today um, and glad that we can have this discussion with our experts. Um, so the topic for today's webinar is Air's property, um, specifically in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and how that impacts our work for clean water and our conservation work. Um, and I will leave it to our experts to explain uh, the basic principles of what Air's property is, how it occurs, and all of that good stuff. Um, but the reason that we wanted to discuss it as a coalition is to acknowledge that we spend a lot of time advocating for federal funding, various federal programs, and Air's property owners actually face a lot of barriers to accessing those programs, um, such as Farm Bill conservation titles and RCS funding. And there has been some work done to kind of mitigate that, um, which you are going to hear about today. But I think it's important that we acknowledge, even as we're accessing for this funding to be available to farmers and landowners throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed, there are still some barriers um, that we need to understand and um, to work to mitigate those. So um, you're going to hear a little bit more about that today and both understand the basic principles of what Air's property is, how it impacts the landowners and farmers. Um, but also what we as coalition members and as an environmental community, um, the action items that we can take to support these efforts um, to make those you know, funds more accessible to folks who wanna participate in conservation. Um, so with that, I will briefly introduce our speakers for today. So starting off with the basics on Air's property, we have John Pollock, who's joining us from Alabama, and he is the coordinator of the Air's Property Retention Coalition and joining him for our introduction section, we have Catherine Woolley, who is a uh, member of the Pro Bono, Bono um, Attorney Network with the Chesapeake Legal Alliance. And they're going to go through the basics of what Air's property is. Um, and John's going to talk to us a little bit about the Uniform Partition of Air's Property Act. And then we're going to follow that um, with Ebony Alexander of the Black Family Land Trust and Parker Adelisto of the Capital Region Land Conservancy. And they are gonna talk about their experience actually getting the Uniform Partition Act passed in Virginia in the most recent legislative session in 2020 um, and what that experience is like. And then we can wrap it up with how can the coalition and uh, the conservation community kind of generally engage with this issue moving forward and what some action items are for us to take away. So that is an overview of um, our discussion for today. And with that, I will hand it over to John and Catherine to get us started. And you are both co-hosts, so you should be able to share your screens if you have any slides for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Emily. And it's great to see so many people um, interested in this issue. Uh, I will just say, as a, as a uh, on a personal note, that um, when I started working on this issue in 2006, I don't think you could have found 30 people who even knew what airs like what some of these issues were, let alone like having so many people working on the issue, it's come a long way in the last 15 years. And it's really exciting to see such interest. Um, the Uniform Act has a lot to do with that, but there's there are other causes as well. So uh, I'll just talk to you a little bit about how Air's property is created um, and what the basically what the problems are with it. And then we'll, and then, um, we'll talk a little bit about solutions. So Air's property is actually not a legal term. It's a, uh, the legal term for Air's property is called tenancy in common. That's what a lawyer would call it. And basically what happens is you have a piece of property that someone owns and they pass the property down in a way that causes multiple people to own that property. And there, there are two main ways that that happens. One is that they die intestate, which means that they didn't have a will. And if they don't have a will, then the property passes down to their heirs and who the heirs are is defined by state law. You know, usually it starts with like the children and the spouse. And then if they're not available, you know, if, if they aren't there, then it descends to like cousins and um, you know, basically it, it, there's like sort of spreading out pattern that, that it will follow. The other way that it can be created is if a, if a property owner says, does actually have a will and says, I give my property to my two sons, that will create heirs property too, because unless the owner actually 
specifies which part of the property each of them gets and actually has a plot plan done with lines, barrier line, with boundary lines for each of the, you know, each of those pieces. In other words, they'd have to create a subdivision of the property. If they just say that their two, their two sons or their five daughters or whatever get the property, that will create heirs property in the same way that not having a will at all would do. So one of the messages we like to deliver is that it's not just important to have a will, it has to actually be done, done correctly in order to avoid creating heirs property. Heirs property is extremely common. Um, and um, in the United States, a lot of property, especially rural property is owned as heirs property. And the reason for that is, um, especially in communities of color uh, that have had an oral tradition of passing down information, there has been a tradition essentially of passing down land ownership orally, not in writing. Um, and that is a that is one of the reasons why heirs property is created. Another very significant reason is a very justifiable tr distrust of the legal community. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, and you know, dating even further back than that, there was a lot of land theft that was that was uh, that happened, and the you know basically the white bar, essentially the legal white legal community was complicit in a lot of that. Um, everything from <clears throat> when the um, Ku Klux Klan would run, literally run black landowners off their property, it, then they would have a deed written up by a lawyer who would basically say, I'm, you know, the property is being transferred to this white owner. Um, and also a lot of white lawyers would just literally, um, you know, go into black communities and say, you know, I'll help you with whatever, I'll help you draft a will, I'll help you whatever. And they would write a document that gave the property to themselves or to someone else. So for after decades and decades of that kind of treatment by the legal community, a lot of people are skeptical of, um, of the legal community of approaching a lawyer to do something like write a will or, or handle the transfer of the property. Um, even, and I, I should say now that that distrust extends even to legal services organizations that have reached out to heirs property owners. They, a lot of owners are again, skeptical, especially where something's being offered for free. There's a distrust of that service that you know it will be used to, dis to disenfranchise black landowners especially. Um, uh, so basically the oral tradition is a big cause of heirs property, the justifiable distrust of the legal community. Another really big reason is myths about heirs property and how it works. A lot of heirs property owners think that the more owners there are, the safer the ownership is. And it's, we're gonna talk about why that's not the case, but that is a very common misunderstanding of how, the land, how land ownership works when you have multiple owners. And another myth is that if someone paid the taxes um, they own the property and that, that, um, that creates a situation where um, that's not, in fact not how heirs property works at all. Tax ownership, paying taxes does not have to do with ownership of the property. Um, although it can cause the loss of it, paying the taxes doesn't make you the owner of the property. And so that, mis that misunderstanding can also lead to, um, to furtherings, furtherings of this problem. So you know, we don't have really good data on the scope of heirs property, but some of the surveys have done have shown that, you know, I think I've seen anywhere from like, you know, 20 to 30% of rural property is potentially heirs property. You know, that, that is like when you're talking about acreage, that's just a humongous size of property, especially when you consider that heirs property um, and rural area, excuse me, that rural property is the dominant area in most states. You know, you have urban areas, but then you have large swaths in every state of, of rural property. So you're talking about a problem of, of really massive proportions. And it, you might think, you know, given that, why is it so little known? And in fact, it is, it is really a problem that's not well understood, even in the legal community. You'd be hard for us to find many lawyers who knows, know what heirs property is or, or what the problems are or how to deal with them. I, when we started this work, I used to call it the worst problem that no one's heard of. And that like is really true. Like it, this has caused massive disenfranchisement, massive economic loss, um, and, and it really is not a problem, a problem that has been well studied, well understood um, in the legal community, sure, but also in the general public. And the lack of understanding of that is partially why the problem keeps perpetuating itself because there's so little awareness of heirs property and its, uh, and its problems. So what problems do you have when you have all the owners that pass down from property to property? Well, the first one is that with every generation, you're gonna have more owners. If I pass down my property to four children, and my four children, each property, pass their property down to two children, the numbers just keep increasing every generation. And then it's kind of like Humpty Dumpty. Once you've broken it, once you've, it's been broken, you can't easily put the pieces back together again. If I pass down my property to my four children and each of those four children write a will from that point on, and everyone writes a will from that point on, it will not, it will still be heirs property. 
because that original fracture caused four, four ownership interests. And the best that those owners can do absent special action is to just keep it to four and not have it be 16 or 100 or literally a thousand. In some cases, you can have a thousand owners of a piece of property. That property could be one quarter acre and you could have a thousand owners of it. Um, so you're talking about a, a problem that just gets worse from generation to generation. And increasingly it becomes hard to know who those owners are. Um, the family members generally are the ones who know the best, you know, they have a sense of it, but when you have out of state owners um, that the family's not in contact with, they don't know who's, who, who's married who, who, what children have existed and so on and so forth. So it becomes increasingly difficult to know who your body of owners are. And then you have a significant conflict between, often between the owners who are in state and especially the owners who are on the property and those owners who are not on the property. They, the owners who are not on the property may have very different interests. They may want the property sold so that they can just get the cash out of it. The in, the, the in state and especially the on the ground um, property users may be using it for certain purposes that they don't want to stop. So you have conflicting interests and heirs property, unfortunately, says that everyone essentially has the right to use and occupation of the land. There's no, there's no system for basically how you manage that. No, no one owner is allowed to exclude the other owners from usage, but but any owner has the right to use the property and then they have to account to the other owners for how they use it. So for instance, if one of them, if one of the owners farms the land for timber, they can do that. The, the, they have that right as an heirs property owner, um, but they have to share the timber proceeds with the rest of the owners. Um, so it, 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 it just, from a management standpoint, it gets very complicated the more owners you have to try to figure out how you're going to manage the property and how you're going to deal with people who have different ideas about what they want to do. And then you also have problem of taxes. Taxes become increasingly difficult to keep track of, who, specifically who's paying them. Often a lot of people think there's one person who is and that person may not in fact be doing it. And if you don't keep track of the taxes, the property can get lost to tax foreclosure. And that happens quite often, basically where the property is put up for sale to pay the unpaid taxes. And you know, I can't count the number of times we've heard that story of everyone thinks, oh, you know, so-and-so is taking care of it. So-and-so may may have taken care of it for a while is no longer doing so may have passed away you know there are all sorts of things that can happen um another big one and this is you know where the uniform act comes in is partition sales and basically partition sales are where um an owner of the property one of the co-owners basically says i want the property sold now here's the really interesting thing about partition if you have 500 owners of the property and one owner says, I wanna sell and 499 say they don't, the property can still get sold. It has nothing to do with how many property owners want it, nothing at all. In fact, you could have an owner that has one tenth of 1% of an interest in the property and the 99 people who own 99% of the property say, we don't want this, that does not make any difference. Um, when the court makes a determination of whether it's going to be sold or not, it's not based on how much ownership interest each person has of, of the person that wants it. That's not relevant to the, in, in terms of the law as it currently exists before the Uniform Act. What happens in a partition sale is the court makes a decision, a single decision, which is, should I divide the property among the owners, physically divide it, or should I sell it? Although the law says they're supposed to prefer dividing it, they never ever divide it because the courts do not want to have to go through the work of figuring out how to do that, the, to basically figure out how do I equally take this parcel and divide it up so that everyone gets a fair share of the property. The more owners there are, the harder that gets, the more expensive it gets, the courts don't wanna do it. Um, the person who's seeking a sale of the property certainly doesn't wanna do that. Um, and I'll get to why that is in a minute, but basically courts routinely order properties. If it goes to partition, the property is almost always sold. And, and, and a reason for that additionally is that the owners who are not in possession, who are in possession and when are on the receiving end, who don't want it sold are almost always poor and almost always can't afford a lawyer. So they cannot fight off the partition action. And partition, the USDA has, has named partition as one of the leading causes of land loss, especially in like among black farm owners in the, in the United States over the last hundred years. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, partition when we get to the Uniform Act, because we'll talk about you know, what the problem is that the act was seeding, you know, specifically trying to deal with. Um, just a couple of other, another um, couple of things I'll mention really quickly, and then I'll give Catherine a chance to jump in. Um, lack of clear title. Um, when you have this many owners and you don't know who they are, you can't go to a bank and say, we'd like a loan, please, because the bank's going to say, we don't know who we're, who we're lending to. We don't know who this, the picture of these owners are. 
And figuring out who the owners are is a very laborious and expensive process that, that a lawyer has to engage in to go through the title records. And even, even so, you have to understand these are not properties pieces that are passed down by some sort of deed that's recorded in the, in the registry of deeds. They can't find out that way. They have to look at like inheritance, right? They have to basically look at birth records and death records. And it's, it's, it's a very difficult, very time consuming process to do it. And because heirs property owners don't have clear title, they could have a property that's in theory worth $10 million and they can't get a loan to pay the taxes or do anything else because they don't have clear title on the property. And so basically we have millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars locked away essentially in these properties that poor landowners could access. In fact, it may be the only asset they have but, and that they could use potentially to start a business or do other things, but they can't because that value is locked in the property. They can't get at it. There are ways to fix that. Um, <clears throat> and um, the Uniform Act was not intended to fix that problem, actually. It was intended to basically stop the bleeding, to keep the ownership from being ripped away from the heirs property owners, but it doesn't stop heirs property from being heirs property. The only way you can solve that problem the only way and that, that you can start tapping into that value is to take all those ownership interests and put them with one entity, basically, whether it's a limited liability corporation, whether it's a land trust, whether it's whatever it is, it has to be something, something or someone, a single person that owns the property outright and everyone else has an interest. Um, and then that way, and you know, when you do it with an LLC or a land trust, no matter who dies, it's not going to affect the, you know, the ownership will still be with the land trust. It will still be with the LLC. All people have is an interest. Their interest will pass down, but the ownership will stay in the land trust. And therefore the land trust or the LLC can borrow money for whatever purpose. And that's, and then that can benefit all of the landowners. But in order to do that, all the landowners have to agree. And that means you have to try to find the ones that you may not even know exist and get all of them on the same page. That is a massive, massive undertaking to do, um, to get everyone. So, you know, we don't have the time today to talk about that process, but suffice it to say, part of the reason we created the Heirs Property, the Uniform Partition Act was because we have to buy time for this process. It's, it's not fast to, to fix, even when you've identified. And the U Uniform Act stops the bleeding, but it does not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So I will stop there um, and give, um, turn it over to Catherine. Do I hit my screen now? Hi, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Woolley. And uh, one of the good things that I discovered uh, by being a lawyer is when you find someone who's a lot smarter and knows more about something than you do, you can turn it over. And John certainly is that person. Just want to thank him for the work he's done over all these years. It truly would not be an issue anyone knows about, if not for the work of people who are willing to do it over a sustained period of time. I just wanted to step back. I'm barred in Maryland, and I can speak uh, about Maryland principles, which are generally the same across the states and trusts uh, and real property. Something that John spoke about is tenants in common. Uh, and you may be familiar with different forms of property ownership. I want to step back and define the three main terms uh, and just give a little bit more uh, information as to how these are uh, and a point of reference. Another form of property ownership is tenants by the entirety and that is a form of property ownership that really can only uh, be owned by married couples certainly in Maryland and I believe across the country. Another form is joint tenancy with the right of survivorship and that's uh, that is when uh, the property interest can be severed by one owner. But what we're talking about when we're talking about tenants in common is, as John said, that fractional ownership of property. And to expand a little bit on something he said, a lot of this property uh, during reconstruction was given to black landowners. And for all the reasons that John described, they were, this land was passing without a will. And you can see that we are now talking about many, many generations where this land has been held by, by uh, African-American landholders, but now we have so many uh, people with a fractional interest in that property. So when you think about it, and when you think about the period of time that we're talking about since Reconstruction and up until today, I think it illustrates how many people have a fractional interest in much of this land and how big a problem it can become. One question that uh, we get um, 
also is what happens when you die without a will in Maryland. That is largely now defined by statute and what's called intestate succession. And it's going to lay out who your property goes to. But again, as John said, if we're talking about what is um, so often doesn't have clear title and these, uh, and to that end, uh, you are get, you're giving that fractional interest in what you may have thought was a whole piece of property. Where does this occur in Maryland? Well, for, again, for reasons that uh, in across the watershed, uh, it's very hard to track. Generally, as John said, when you find rural property, you're going to find heirs property. In Maryland, uh, what we can, what we know from our history is that in Baltimore County, that's traditionally an area where there were a lot of black farmers and also critically on our Eastern shore and our black watermen. Uh, it is very hard to see in advance and identify in advance. And, and we'll speak more about that in solutions. But one thing that uh, further muddies the water and for anyone who has ever tried to do a title search in a rural courthouse on the East Coast, you, uh, it's a functional equivalent of banging your head against a wall at some time. These are not digital records. Uh, they are, it's very hard to do a, a title search. Uh, think about the reasons that we have title insurance in the beginning. It's because it's so hard to, uh, be, to, to insure yourself against the risks that the seller will not be able to convey clear title. Uh, and so when you overlay all these issues, uh, John's correct that there, there often are not clear solutions, though I think we'll define more. But one thing that I just did want to emphasize is uh, that these are, regardless of whether we're talking about Maryland or Virginia or across the country, most of these are what we call common law principles uh, in terms of when we're defining property ownership in real estate. So when we're talking about the difference between tenants and common tenants in the entirety, joint tenants with right of survivorship, for anyone who's listening who's not in Maryland and says, does this apply to me? That's, those are pretty basic legal terms that I think we can all uh, take as we move forward in this conversation. Thank you. So I can um, talk a little bit about the Uniform Act and why we created it. Um, I will I will say that you know when we started this idea, we had you know one of the ideas was like, can we change the way that heirs' property is created in the first place? And the answer was no. <laughs> basically, like that would have been to try to do that nationally would have been basically impossible. You know, it, we, we, we and even if we had, it wouldn't have stopped heirs' property. It would have just maybe reduced the number of heirs' property owners. It couldn't have. We, there's no way you can eliminate the number of owners. Um, it would have just made, it's maybe meant that like, so you'd have like, you know, four owners created instead of 10 with one generation, but it wouldn't have stopped the problem. So we saw partition really as a, as a devastating, um, devastating really rural, especially black communities. And one of the reasons that happens is you'll have land speculators and they basically, land speculators know where the value of property is often before anyone else in the area does. They know where development's going to be happening. They know where an interstate is going to be happening. They know, they know. And they'll approach landowners in a particular area and they'll offer to buy the property for pennies on the dollar. Um, the owners, um, so some of the owners just sell out um, and, and then, um, and that happens. But, but sometimes the owners will resist and they'll say, we don't wanna sell this property. Um, this is our ancestral home. We've owned it for centuries. They, 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 um, and so basically you'll have some owners who are holdouts. All, all that land speculator has to do is find one, one owner who's willing to sell to them. It doesn't matter how little ownership that one owner has. Um, is if they buy that one interest, they have the same rights as every other owner on the property. And it doesn't matter if they have one hundredth of a percent of interest and it doesn't matter if they bought it yesterday they can turn around today and go to the court and say, I want to force a partition sale of this property. I want the property put up for auction. If the court, if that is filed, the court will decide, am I going to divide the property or am I going to sell it? As I mentioned before, courts always sell the property. That is just the way it goes. The petitioner, the speculator will have a lawyer. The lawyer is going to be able to press for that very effectively. The, the, the people on the other side do not. Right now, when the courts do that, um, what happens is basically they put it up for auction. Literally, they post a notice on the courthouse steps 
they hold the auction on the courthouse steps. Is, it's sort of figurative, but basically that's how it happens. They post a notice somewhere. The property is generally sold for almost nothing to the person who brought the action in the first place, because that's why they brought it. They they brought the action to acquire the property. We've we've heard, we've seen the property sold for as little as ten percent of its actual value, and the speculator will then turn around and sell it the next week for ten times that much. That's exactly what happens. So all of that equity is ripped out of the property, stolen really from the owners who who had the rights to it, and. Um, and the courts often say, when they're trying to decide whether to sell or divide it, they'll say, well, if dividing it would reduce the value of the property, then we're not gonna divide it. Well, guess what? Dividing the property almost always does reduce the, the value because divided property is going to be, you know, it's just logical that if you have one giant tract, it's gonna be worth more than lots of little pieces, but that cannot be the sole determinant, especially when you're looking at property that has non-economic value for the owners. We're talking about property that some families have owned for 200 years. You know, this is original. This is original forty acres and a mule property, um, in some families' cases, and they have. Um, it's not fungible. They can't just go out and buy ancestral property. You can't give them money to compensate what they're going to lose. It's not possible. So, basically, the court will force a sale. They'll they'll basically the person who runs the sale. It, it just keeps getting better. The person who runs the sale is the attorney who for who had brought the action in the first place. That's who the court appoints to actually handle the sale. And then when the property is sold and the attorney is paid, they take their, their fee from the proceeds of the sale. The person who hired them doesn't pay them. They take their money from the proceeds and they not only take it from the proceeds, they take it from everyone's proceeds, including the people who opposed the sale in the first place. So essentially you're paying the lawyer who dispossessed you. This is the system that we, this is the system that we came into in 2006 and said, no, this is not acceptable. There was not one state out there that had a, a partition law that was fair, not one in the entire country. I know because I surveyed all 50 of them before we started this project just to see, is there any state that we can just say, here's what we should do? The answer was no. But each state did have pieces of things that we wanted. And so what the, what the Partition Act, Uniform Partition of Errors Pro Property Act does are three main things. The first thing it says is, if a person brings an action and asks for a sale, they don't ask for a division, they ask for a sale, they first have to offer their ownership interest to the rest of the owners. If the rest of the owners buy out that interest, it's over. Um, and that's really the simplest way to get rid of these cases. And it just makes sense. The whole reason why courts created partitions, the whole reason for a partition sale existing is the idea that if you have owners who are locked into this structure and don't wanna be part of it anymore, there has to be a way for them to get out. That was the reason why they created partition cells in the first place. But if you can buy that person's interest, that achieves that same purpose while not dispossessing all the rest of the owners. So the Partition Act has this very complicated formula and process for the owners who are not bringing the action to buy out the interest of the person who is in possession. Note that buying out that person is a lot different than buying the whole property. The families generally cannot afford to buy the whole property at auction. They don't have the cash, but buying a 100th interest, they might be able to get that together. So the first thing the court, it does is it says, the, the person has to offer that if they do and it's bought out, end of story, action goes away. The second thing it does is it says, if that doesn't happen, the court has to weigh whether to divide, and as court is weighing to whether to divide or sell, it gives them a whole list of criteria that they have to use to make that determination, including non-economic use of the land, ancestral value, community value, um, all sorts of sort of equitable principles. And it says, you know, cash alone cannot be, the, none of these can be the determinative factor. The court has to weigh all of the factors together. That is an extremely important um, to the, to the, um, to basically change the balance, the way that the courts think about this. And the last big thing it does is it says, if the court says after all that, it's still gonna sell the property, it has to use a realtor. It can't just put the property up for auction. The property has to be sold in a way that's gonna maximize its sale price so that all the owners who are getting dispossessed are not just ripped off by this process. There are some smaller things that the act does, but those were the, the really, you know, really significant three pieces that we wanted. Um, we started, the Uniform Act was um, proposed to the Uniform Law Commission in 2009. We've, it, the drafting process was finished in 2011. Um, there are now, I think, we were told when, when we went for this that we would never get any state to pass it. Like land, land uh, laws like this are very, very difficult to get through legislatures and especially ones that disenfranchise, you know, largely black owners, no one cares. It's just the reality. Um, and we have now, I think 16 states that have passed it including, including most of the South. Um, and that includes Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, Arkansas, Texas. I mean, we basically, 
we really, and those were the areas we really have, we, that's where my coalition and our organizations really focused our efforts was in the South, because that's where we knew the problem was the most significant. Um, so we've gotten, you know, th there's been a tremendous reception to it. And one of the reasons that happened was that in addition, one of the things that's furthered the cause is that the farm bill in 2000, I think it was 2018 or 2017, was amended to say that if a state passes the Uniform Act, that they get additional access to loan, to loan resources. That caused a whole bunch of Midwestern states to suddenly get really interested in passing the act because it gave them more access to capital. So that has uh, that wasn't there when we first started, but that's now an input that's pushing some of the additional states that we're working in to get this done. Um, there's a lot more that I could say about the act and you know how we got there and all that, but in the interest of time, I think I'll stop there. I know there are some questions in the chat as well that I can attempt to answer while others are, are speaking, but... Um, I don't know, Emily, if you want me to just take a minute to field any questions right now or how you'd like to proceed. Yeah, I, um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat and I saw that you began to answer some of the questions in here, so thank you. Um, I don't know, I saw Robin just put in, are you aware if West Virginia has passed um, a version of the Uniform Partition Act? And I'm happy to send a link to everyone after um, with the Uniform Partition Act as well. Um, yeah, it has um, actually, so West Virginia, the story is it has been introduced many times, I think at least two or three times. And at first we ran into trouble with the, um, I think it was like mining interests. Like there was concern about subsurface rights of heirs property and how the act dealt with that, which was something I, we, I don't think we had fully sort of dealt with that in the original draft. So there was a compromise hammered out in the West Virginia version and then it didn't pass anyway. Um, I don't know it's come back like every year and it's just gotten stuck. And I don't know what the latest on it. I know that there are people there who are really trying to get it passed, but it's gotten stuck um, in committee. So, um, and then, um, yes, yeah, so the, the, I'll put a link to the Uniform Act. The, the Uniform Law Commission has a really nice page that has the act itself. It shows what states it's passed in. It shows, it has the, like supporting documents, um, including letters of support that were generated and frequently asked questions. There's a lot of stuff there um, including, um, I think the background memo. So the, I will tell you this, that the, the Uniform Act itself has a very long sort of memo in it um, that explains why it was passed. And so that is a good background resource itself to sort of get more familiar with this issue. Um, and um, um, so, so was that a question about Virginia, whether New York and Virginia have passed it? Um, I think that if I remember, yes, New York has passed it, um, Virginia, um, is, um, yeah, so we're gonna talk about Virginia today. That's what's coming later in the presentation. Um, but, um, uh, and then there was a question about the Bay State. So like out West, um, Chesapeake I don't, side. what's that? <laughs> Which, Chesapeake what, sorry? So Chesapeake, Chesapeake, oh, sorry. <laughs> Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Um, uh, uh, right. Um, so it is not past Pennsylvania. You know, we're talking about Maryland today. It's past Virginia. Um, it's been pending in DC for some time, but has not passed yet. Um, what other states would that be? Delaware, any? Maryland. I know we have a um, few folks on the call that I think are working on it in Maryland. Um, and West Virginia yeah. would be the other one. Yeah, Delaware has not, has not passed it. Um, and West, like I, I mentioned, West Virginia um, and Ebony added in the chat, Mississippi and Florida um, have passed it. So it's it's really it's really been stunning like how far it's gotten like it, it really I think there was it's just a lot of people put in a lot of hard work on, on the ground to get the first handful of states passed and that really created the momentum. Um, so yeah, I think um, again there's a lot to say about the Uniform Act and and I should say that the the where we're going from here is um, there is a conversation about how to make it easier to get property into a land trust or an LLC. Um, and that's where the Uniform Law Commission is going now from the Partition Act. Like there's a committee, there was a study committee created to look at that issue. And so we've been talking about, you know, can we do that? Can we, can we make that easier? Because that is a really big hurdle right now. It's, it's time consuming, expensive. And, you know, the gist of that would be to basically make it so that you could have fewer than unanimous consent to get into a land trust. Like there would be some sort of majority rule instead of everyone having to get everyone. Um, it's tricky. Um, no doubt to, to basically say you're going to do it without the consent of some of the owners. Um, but, you know, that's why we have to be tread very carefully and ensure we're talking to community stakeholders and others to make sure we're not going to do something that's going to make it worse. Um, there was a, um, the question also was, um, if you can't find someone, 
um, you know, basically you have to make, you know, very diligent efforts. The court can appoint a lawyer to represent the interests of the unknown or unlocatable heirs, as it's called, which is what they'll typically do if, if you can't find, I mean, there's some cases where you're just not going to be able to find them. There are no ways, but you have to make significant efforts to find them. Um, on the flip side, we know that land speculators do not make a significant effort. In fact, we've had cases where people who are living on the property didn't get notice of the partition sale, let alone some vague, like unknown owner. And, you know, again, because you don't have a lawyer on the other side, a lot of this chicanery happens and that's a really big problem. Thanks, John. Um, I yeah. I think um, just in the interest of time, if we can save the rest of the questions in here at the end, we will keep an eye on it to make sure that all the questions get answered. But I'll go ahead and hand it over to Parker and Ebony and they can speak to the um, recent experience of being able to pass the Uniform Partition Act in the Virginia State Legislature um, and talk a little bit about the stakeholder engagement that went on um, and some of the you know changes that were made um, to make it work for their state. So I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you. Parker, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to start, Parker? Sure. Um, well, Ebony, this is really your your thing. How about I let you start and then I'll fill in the <clears throat> fill in some gaps unless you I know you got an issue at home. So if you're if your sauna <laughs> is creating it uncomfortable, I'll take over. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we are just over the moon excited about our success in Virginia um, of getting the Uniform Petition Act enacted here um, as of July 1. We started off um, in December of 2018 on a whim um, with the land trust community. I had been at a meeting and um, Thomas Mitchell asked me if we thought we could get it done in Virginia. And I said, eh, why not? We'll try. <laughs> and I went back to Vault, which is the Virginia United Land Trust and said, what do you think? You think we could get this um, passed? Everybody, at, particularly since the 2018 Farm Bill had come out, yes, this is a good idea. And we tried. Um, we had like three months, two months to get everything together to find sponsors. It did not pass the first time, but what we did was um, the last six months of 2019, we had formed a working coalition of land trust, um, other conservation and environmental organizations and other people interested in, who had an interest in heirs property. And we framed it not as an issue of race or class or ethnicity or gender, but as an issue of lack of access to resources and education. Um, Virginia has a very um, progressive governor, but that doesn't mean that the legislature matches his progressiveness. So we were concerned that we needed to, and I'm a native of Maryland, um, so I understand Maryland politics well. Um, I, um, so what we did was we framed it this way and we, we, I think the tagline that, that we used all the time was, if you have a hundred acres in Rockingham County or Buckingham County, North of Virginia, or you have a um, hundred thousand dollar condo on Broad Street in Richmond. If you die without a will, you've created heirs' property. So it doesn't make any difference where you are, how much it costs, um, what the va the the land mass is. You have to have a will in place. So we took race out of it, and I think that that's what made it work. And then we decided that everybody had to have a role in this. We needed to have people who found sponsor, who would help us identify sponsors for the bill. Um, our organizations who had lobbyists in the General Assembly added this to their legislative agenda. Um, we had it as the, in the legislative agenda for vault. Um, there were other organizations that supported us, particularly the Farm Bureau um, the um, American Farmland Trust um, supported us. We had support from- Land Trust Alliance. The Land Trust Alliance and from um, the League of um, Conservation League. So those were just kind of the, 
broader people that we had or organizations that we had support from. And because of that, <clears throat> and because everybody did their homework, I mean, this was, I, I still insist we need to do a case study on this. We were a group of people who met on the second Friday of every month at 9.30 in the morning. Everybody had an assignment. We reported out. I think half of us had never seen each other face to face. If we had walked past each other in the department store, we wouldn't have known who we were. Um, but we managed to get it done. Um, we ran into a snag, and I'll let Parker talk about that because he helped navigate that for us with um, a committee called Boyd's Gray in Virginia. But at the end of the day, we ended up passing this legislation in Virginia unanimously from every committee and across the aisle to the governor's desk. Mm -hmm. Parker? Well, and I wanna give Ebony a lot of credit because the this initiative didn't start in uh, 2018, as she said. Ebony's been working on this with landowners for much longer uh, in Virginia and North Carolina and other areas. Um, what I think also is very important on this timeline, and as John mentioned that um, early on 2006, there was this request um, to look into reforming partition laws. And for you all that are looking to do this, perhaps in your own state, the first thing to do is to see if your state bar made a request to the Uniform Partition, uh, the Uniform Commission requesting that this uh, uniform partition be addressed. If your state bar asked for that, you have good support internally from lawyers uh, at your state level. Virginia, they were part of that original uh, body that requested that the Uniform Commission address heirs' property. From there, it just kind of sat dormant. And as I think was said, a lot of states just didn't do anything. Virginia is a very pro-property rights um, state where if you have ownership, you're going to pretty much get whatever you want. And in that instance, I think that there was a lot of influence from the realtors and from developers uh, and from people who are constantly down at the General Assembly lobbying for their, uh, their agendas. And heirs' property simply did not meet their, uh, meet their agendas. And so we had to simply address that. We worked uh, for the first year with a senator um, who we thought had really good uh, relationships across the aisle from Democrats and Republicans. Um, and she was um, kind of in a South Side district, but also represented urban communities. So she understood that. She didn't win re-election. Um, <laughs> and she, we were all there in the, the Justice Committee hearing. And she basically came and whispered to us and said, look, you know, this the best thing we can hope for right now is to have it tabled till next year. Um, we went into that initial year with the support of the Uniform Commission and the other individuals that Ebony had mentioned originally. Farm Bureau was there, um, but it was not a large coalition at that time. And the thing that astonished us was that the committee members, even though the bill was introduced in the very first week of the General Assembly session, committee members stated that they just were not familiar enough with the issue. The Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act had been around for a decade. The state uh, bar had requested it. There was an article that Ebony had helped uh, get planted in the Virginia Lawyer publication only that summer that talked about heirs property, that talked about all the impact, the human impact and here are these legislators just simply saying, we don't know anything about it. And uh, Rosalind Dance, who was the Senator that was the patron originally said, let's table it, let's get to work on education. And so we did that. And the, the probably the largest vocal critic of it in Virginia was the Virginia Bar Association. Now the state bar is on the state side. They're kind of like government employees. The bar association is where Anybody who practices law can be a member and, and that kind of helps build a, uh, an influence as it relates to the profession of law. Well, they opposed it. 
particularly from estate trusts and wills. And we're thinking, how could they go on record saying they don't know anything about heirs' property when they are representing the Bar Association of the Estates Trust and Wills Division? This is insane. Um, so we, we took the, the, the year hiatus and we worked through that time period and really, as Ebony already mentioned, worked with our cohorts to really build a coalition to identify new sponsors since uh, Senator Dance did not win re-election. And uh, we also spent that time in a regular communication with representatives of the Bar Association as well as Virginia's uh, commissioner to the Uniform Commission, uh, an individual named Chris Nolan, who works at a private law firm. And knowing that the Uniform Commission was proposing this, Chris was a great ally um, and he could talk the lawyer talk where we weren't lawyers, we couldn't talk the lawyer talk. And we just were hopeful that they would learn and move forward. Well, we didn't get much progress all summer. And then the next thing we heard was, they weren't gonna make a decision, they were gonna send it to a committee to vote thumbs up or thumbs down on the legislation. And we weren't invited to present our case to this committee of the Bar Association. And it was at the Boyd Graves Conference that you know I guess they hold it at like the homestead or some nice resorts and they get to you know say that they had their conference. And the individual who was tasked with this particular committee uh, on uniform petition was an individual whose name is Dave Gogol from Northern Virginia. We didn't know Dave Gogol at all. And our call, he said, look, I think there's a lot of good things in the Uniform Petition Act, but I can tell you, there's some things that we really aren't gonna wanna support. And this is from the lawyers. And we said, well, you know, it's our understanding if we don't get the whole thing, then the Farm Bill and, and the Uniform Commission just simply will say Virginia did not pass the Uniform Petition of Heirs Property Act. And through this whole process, we stayed in close contact. And what resulted was the Bar Association coming back and saying, we believe that there are ways to not only improve heirs property in Virginia, but to go ahead and address the entire Partition Act in Virginia, irregardless of the ownership status, irregardless of whether the ownership is classified as tenants in common or some other structure. So now all of the partition law in Virginia is the same. And it follows the same process as what John Pollock had outlined. Um, and Thomas Mitchell, uh, who kind of helped with the Uniform uh, Partition Act drafting of that legislation, he was there with the Bar Association, with us as the stakeholder group advocating. And we reached agreement on the revised statute that was then introduced early in the session by two different parties. We had a Republican in the Senate. We had a Democrat in the House. We had a rural representative. We had an urban representative. We had Southside Virginia. We had Northern Virginia. We made sure that from, the, uh, from those who sponsored the legislation that we covered our bases. And because of the, the Virginia's United Land Trust stretching throughout the entire state, we had a coalition of about 28 organizations that could write to their legislators on a local basis who had those relationships and basically advocate for passage. And that then trickled up. And as Ebony said, in every committee, in every body, in every vote, uh, the, the bills were passed unanimously. And that's a very rare feat in Virginia where you have a fairly divided legislature. Um, so we're really pleased with the outcome. Uh, we did a lot of op-eds. We did a lot of uh, articles and uh, communication about heirs' property so that people knew about it. Uh, and most importantly, we followed up with thank you letters to every single legislator at the end, whether they voted for it or didn't. Well, I guess nobody didn't vote for it. <laughs> we didn't have to deal with that. Um, so I, I think that's how we approached it. But you really almost, we didn't know who was going to be our opposition until we got in there. And that's probably the area that is your blinders that um, 
you know, just don't let them kill it if you're going to move forward in your state, but say we can talk through it. And Virginia talked through it where the, the lawyers felt that there was a much better outcome. We were, thank you, Parker, we were really strategic about who we selected as our sponsors. That was, I think, one of the key things that we had to do. Um, and as Parker said, we had urban, rural, we had both parties, and we had young and old um, as well. There was an age difference, a vast age difference between them as well. But the other thing I think that we had to our advantage is that because we had, well, not we had, we built a relationship, a very cordial working relationship with our representative to the Uniform Law Commission, um, he was able to help us in ways, I think he went beyond the call of duty to help us get through, to negotiate, and really give us the, the best advice that he could. Um, we were very fortunate. We were very, and the other thing is we had the full support of the governor and his cabinet. And that was quietly known at first. And then it became more and more well known that the governor wanted this passed um, right down to the secretary of agriculture and forestry um, testifying on behalf of the bill in committee. Emily, can I add just a couple of quick things? Um, Real fast, um, just yeah, and then was, I want to make sure we have time for questions. Sure, um, it was mentioned that the bill passed unanimously in Virginia. It's passed unanimously everywhere. Every state that we have passed, you know, you could speculate that some some of that is because the lawmakers literally had no idea what they were signing. But um, actually, a lot of work was really done to in, in most of the southern states to ensure that there was a Republican sponsor of the bill. Almost in almost every case. Another thing is um, the link I gave to the ULC. Um, web page about the Uniform Act. If you go there, you'll see on one of the tabs, there's, it, it has a documents tab and there's an enactment kit in there. And in the enactment kit, you'll see letters of support from a whole bunch of organizations that we managed to get um, to get to sign on to, the, uh, to, get, to get on there. And some of the really key ones like the American College of Real Estate Lawyers, um, the, um, the NAACP, the National Bar Association, um, the, the American, American Bar Association, um, the National Black Caucus of State Legislatures, but, but these were all things that helped with those early states and they will certainly help with passage in Maryland to have all those support letters. Um, and the last thing was just quickly bar opposition. Attorneys make a lot of money off of these partition sales. They typically take 10% of the sale proceeds as their, as their profit. Um, it's quick and dirty and easy money for them and they will fight tooth and nail to ensure that that doesn't change. Virtually every piece of opposition we had was from attorneys. We almost never had it from anyone else. And they would basically, they were all um, attorneys or legislators who were attorneys who basically brought these actions themselves and were just trying to preserve their own livelihood. That was what it was about. John, can I trail on what you've said? I'm sorry? Emily, yeah, can I trail on what John said on one point? Um, yeah, really quick, and then I want to turn it over to questions because there are a couple uh, questions in sure. the chat box that we need. To I, sure, and I wanted to actually address the question with my first point, which is really where is the convergence of conservation, heirs property, and what we're talking about today, which is clean water. Uh, and you can really see the quick convergence of interests because we're talking to, today with a community that wants to preserve open spaces, wants to preserve clean water, and uh, and we want to be preserving the intergenerational wealth of this land and, and black landowners uh, right to this property. So what we are seeing and what we saw come straight up the intercoastal waterway where specula speculators and commercial developers come in and buy these small fractional ownership in the property, interest in the property, come in and put big developments in right mm -hmm. up on our waterways. What doesn't anyone probably listening to this want are those kinds of development. So when we're talking about the convergence of conservation, preserving open spaces and preserving people's right to ownership for land that's been in their family for centuries, I think it becomes very quickly apparent where we all have shared interests. What can we do? We can raise public awareness. If you are living in a community, uh, and we've mostly spoken about rural property, but certainly exists in DC in the Bloomingdale neighborhood, um, it exists in Baltimore, um, it exists in cities too, but let's talk about rural right now because that's where we need everyone who's involved in the land trust community to be looking out for their neighbor. 
we need more public awareness and rural legal services are traditionally terribly underfunded, which Ebony could tell you so much more about when we were talking about this previously. I said, let's talk about the, the gap in legal services and she said gap. There's a fundamental lack of legal services. How are legal services funded in this country? And I just would like to raise everyone's awareness to this issue because it's a potential solution. Uh, briefly, for legal, the federal legal services, and that funds legal aid throughout this country and also some grants to other legal services providers, it's provided uh, funding, which is about $125 million a year last time I looked at the numbers, is uh, every lawyer, every law firm, until they earn a fee, has to put their money in escrow. And that money in escrow um, is called an IOLTA account and it's put in a sweep account. So it's swept out overnight and earns a very small percentage of interest, a very small interest, amount of interest on that money. And that uh, is then used to fund legal services. $125 million across this country is not sufficient. Uh, and it does not traditionally, has not traditionally provided access for folks who are poor but have this land to establish clear title. Uh, one thing that we can do is uh, at that federal level and at the state level be encouraging more money and more grants for this. It is a labor intensive proposition. It takes many years. Uh, and what we should also be doing is looking for other funding mechanisms. Are there uh, small um, uh, fees that can be associated with these transactions that can be placed in similar escrow accounts to be funding this on an ongoing basis? I just would really encourage people to be thinking about the provision of legal services, uh, the right to counsel, and how you could not navigate this on your own. No one can. You do need a lawyer. Uh, and how can we pr be providing this through the provision of legal services? And the last thing I'll just uh, end on is I know that some of this has come through the land trust community, but it does then require these, these folks to put their land in trust. And, and some people want to hold on to their land and provide intergenerational wealth. And that's a very, very important thing. Uh, so thank you everyone for participating. Thanks, Catherine. Um, John, if I could have you referring back to both Kristen's question um, about the barrier to federal funding and that provision in the Farm Bill in 2018. Um, if anyone has uh, more information on the effectiveness and the success um, of those efforts in the states that have passed the Uniform Partition Act, that would be great. Yeah, I don't, I don't, um, because my um, involvement basically extends to getting the act passed. What happens after it passes is um, uh, beyond my, um, the scope of the work that I do. So I don't really know like whether it's actually, whether how much, you know, additional loan capital has been accessed because of that I don't, I don't have the information on that. It's possible Thomas might, um, but I don't know. It, it, um, with respect to the, the um, farm bill, the 2018 farm bill, it, what it did was it allowed um, people with heirs property to be able to go into FSA and get a farm and track number. It um, created a loan pool um, which has not been funded yet. It's somewhere between five and $10 million that will be um, managed by a third party uh, that they gave very strict criteria for in the, in the language. And that money can be used to resolve heirs property. And it also provided um, a mechanism for landowners who are um, tenants in common to access uh, money for disaster recovery. Thanks, Ebony. So yeah, I think that clarifies um, but yes, the inability to show clear title was a barrier to accessing some of these federal agency funds and that provision in the farm bill kind of is helping to address some of that. There was also a question in the chat box about um, uh, delinquent tax sales and whether that clears heirs property. And in order for property to be legally transferred, you do have to have clear title or you, you have to be able to have uh, a title policy uh, on it, particularly when it is being sold by the government. Uh, so in that instance, typically the locality will work to expend resources to um, clear the title. And in Richmond, where I 
was on city council for seven years. Uh, there were properties in the district that I represented that had not paid taxes in 40 years. The owner uh, has been deceased for uh, probably 50 years and they can't identify who those heirs are. And there's a, a long prolonged court process to uh, put those uh, for tax sale. And what we are also working on, which goes back into some of what we're talking about from the land conservation or equity side is uh, possibly transferring a percentage of those uh, properties that are eligible for tax sale into a community land trust so that they could be used for affordable housing or that they could be uh, made into urban agricultural plots, et cetera. So there are other ways, but uh, I do not believe that a tax sale can be conducted without addressing the title. Thanks, Parker. I know that we are just over time, um, but really quick, I did want to make everybody aware that in addition to this recent effort in Virginia, there is an effort um, that I was made aware of to pass the act in Maryland. I'm not sure if Lissetta was able to join us or if she is still on the call, um, but if not, I'm happy to connect folks in Maryland uh, with her and that effort so that based on everything we've learned from Ebony and Parker, on their you know, effort to pass in Virginia, um, we might be able to, as a conservation community, uh, make the same thing happen in Maryland and other states. Uh, can I just add to you, Emily, that, you know, just as a last note that this is, you know, we talk about this as being a rural problem and it certainly is, but it, heirs property can happen anywhere. And the, the, the real shock to us when we sort of became fully aware of that was after Katrina in New Orleans, where it turned out that tons of the homes in New Orleans were owned as heirs property. And when the state offered money for the owners to rebuild their homes, the state basically gave owners two options. One was money to rebuild the home, two was just basically cash out. And that was where we started to see the conflict between the owners who lived on the property and the owners who didn't. And it really just kind of blew the cover on the, the idea of, of, of urban heirs property being, you know, really can potentially be a very significant issue. Yeah, thanks, John. I think that's um, an important thing to remember that it's not just affecting the rural areas of our watershed, but that it's showing up everywhere um, in, in all of our states. So with that, um, I did put this in the chat, but I did save the chat. So I'll go ahead and share that along with the link so everyone can refer back to the questions um, along with the answers that were provided in the chat uh, that we didn't necessarily get to. Um, and I will include the links as well that everyone was sharing. Um, so I just wanna go ahead and thank everyone for joining today. Um, I know this was a new topic for a lot of people, maybe others not so much, um, but I think it's a good starting point just to raise awareness in all of the Bay States, um, since there's already been a lot of momentum in more Southern and Southeastern parts of the country um, to start to see some of that in the Bay watershed as well. I saw John just shared his contact information. Um, I'm happy to connect folks after the fact. If you have remaining questions about heirs property, and point you to other resources, um, including some state specific ones since this was a broader conversation. So I wanna thank John and Ebony and Catherine and Parker for sharing your expertise and your experience with us today. Um, and I will follow up with the recording and all these resources that were linked. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.